Good evening. There are still some people that need to arrive, but because we are already a little bit late, we will start anyway. So on behalf of the World Academy of Sciences, I welcome you all to this panel session entitled Circular Economy and Biotechnology for Sustainable Development in the Global South. In order to introduce this topic of circular economy, I would like to focus on one key word, sustainability. The concept is something that not everyone understands, even if the word has been used and overused over the past two decades, especially in the last few years, we've seen this word increasingly used. However, much of its use is probably now called green washing. So I would just like to focus on its meaning. And to understand its meaning, there are three aspects that are important to me and probably not only to me. First, we must know and understand the limits of the planet's resources and the limits of the life supporting systems. Second, once we understand that, we must examine and evaluate our lifestyle and the activities of societies in terms of the impact they have on those resources and on those life supporting systems. Third, once we've evaluated, we must decide accordingly in terms of changing our behavior and adjusting the society's activities for the future generations. This future generations is a key aspect of the concept of sustainability. Another concept is change. I said to change our lifestyle, I said change our activities. So something that we must think about changing is the current economic model. A model based on uh, high energy and overconsumption. This economic model is also known as linear economy. And the concept of circular economy is opposite to it. However, the cost of linear or circular economy is not a new one. Back in 1966, the US American economist Kenneth Boulding wrote very strong words on the economic system that was being established over those years and even in the 50s. He wrote that that economic system was reckless was aggressive, was devastating, was exploitative. He didn't quite synthesize this concept in the, in the expression circular economy, but a few years later, in 1988, another economist, still American, called Alan Nees, very famous, wrote a text in which he synthesized and coined the expression circular economy. And what is remarkable is that he claimed and explained that he must go beyond what we now know today as three R's. The three R's are very famous, reduce consumption, use of resources, etc., reuse and recycle. These are the three R's. But his explanation and definition of circular economy implied that we must go beyond these three R's, including Two things, respect of nature and regeneration of nature. In fact, most recently, we had a, a breakthrough um, uh, in the past few years, a breakthrough uh, piece of work called the Das Gupta Review, and I encourage you to look it up, in which nature becomes part of the economic equation. In fact, Das Gupta is one of the members of our academy 
just like Professor Munta said that I'm about to introduce to you. So we're very lucky to have these uh, three uh, experts and panel members this evening. They will enlighten us. I hope also with examples. Why? Because a question arises. We heard about circular economy now for many years. I mentioned 1966, I mentioned 1988, and after 1998 again, a bit like sustainability in the last few years, circular economy has also been used a lot, almost, you know, to be cool, they say it. However, is it fiction or is it reality? Do we see examples in real life? Are governments really doing it? So I'm really looking forward to hear from our speakers also because they will put forward a perspective from developing countries, which is essential because we must have a global perspective, not a Eurocentric or developed country perspective. So let me start with introducing our first speaker, Lucia Professor Lucia Pitaluga, a professor at the Economic Institute, School of Economics and Management, Universidad de la Republica, Uruguay, yes. next to me here. Her current research is exactly on sustainable circular bioeconomy. So I'm very excited that we'll be listening to you shortly. After Lucia, we'll be listening to Professor Muntasa Ibrahim, professor in the Department of Molecular Biology, Institute of Endemic Diseases at the University of Khartoum, Sudan. He's a member of the Academy and also of the African Academy of Sciences. So thank you, Professor Muntasa, for being with us. Last but not least, we have Professor Maria Coluccio, Chair of the Business Administration Program at the Magna Grecia University of Catanzaro, where she also holds a full professorship in management. Her research focuses on co-creation, social innovation, and circular economy. So I welcome and I thank you. And Lucia, the floor is yours. Yeah. Let's put the presentation on. And uh, well, Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Next for organizing this roundtable. And thank you to TWAS for inviting me to participate. It's a very long trip for, uh, from Uruguay, so I'm very glad to be, to be here and to see all the other roundtables. So, um, four key concepts will guide my presentation to respond uh, to the arise question, no? the future of food systems in Latin America and the Caribbean, an opportunity for circular economy. These four concepts uh, are the transformation of capitalism, resilience, frugality, and just transition. I will come back to them during my, my speaking. In the, in the next minutes. <coughs> this is um, the shared vision of, um, of a coalition in the LAC countries. The LAC countries are the Latin American Caribbean countries. And this is a shared vision. This is, um, it was issued this year about what is circular economy. And as you can see, before, the, the, there are those three principles that Max said. Eliminate waste and pollution, circulate products and materials, regenerate nature. But this, what, what it is important in this shared vision is that they go further. And as you can see, sorry, I can point. Yes, here. As you can see there, there is not, I mean, the, the definition does not want only to apply those three principles in precise manners. They want 
to see the circular economy as a big transformation. And as you can see, there is a transformation in a systemic change. So you don't have only those principles. Those principles are the three principles of circular economy. But those principles have to be inserted in a bigger transformation. And the first point is this transformation in systematic change. The second point is a long-term prosperity, well-being, and resilience. So it's a long-term vision. The third one is diversity and inclusion. So we have there a very important uh, issue in the Latin American countries. And finally, innovation uh, as well as heritage. So that is important. Innovation is important, but it is also important the knowledge that is already in ancestral, ancestrally in, in, in our countries. So let's start from where we stand today. And we stand in the ecological, in an ecological breakdown. The ecological breakdown that we are is due to a structural features of capitalism economy. And by capitalism, I do not mean markets and trade and business. These existed for thousands of years before capitalism. What distinguishes the capitalism I'm talking about is that it is organized around perpetual growth. And that is important, that perpetual growth. And this perpetual growth needs insatiable consumption. <clears throat> but let's go back to 1972. And this is, this is Dennis Meadows. Dennis Meadows, maybe a lot of people know this book, The Limits to Growth, is one of the authors that wrote in 1972 this, uh, this book. And there in the Smithsonian Institution, he's presented the results. The first time he is presenting the results of this uh, report, the report that they, um, they, they elaborated for the Rome Club. I, I don't know if you know, but there was an Italian, Mr. Aurelio Pecce, that gathered a lot of scientific, 30 of some scientifics from all over the countries, from all over the world, just in the Reali Academia di Lince at Rome to study the predicament of mankind. And the result of that gathering and the result of four ex intensive years of work ended in this report, The Limits to Growth. This is a very important book, and it was criticized, very much criticized in that, in that moment, but not by everyone. I, for example, have this first edition that my, my father bought with all his writings. So there were a lot, it, it was a bestseller. The, the, um, the people wanted to read that, that book, but it was a success in terms of bestseller, but it was a failure because policymakers didn't believe what this, uh, this group of very young men uh, wanted to uh, try to say. And they tried to say that the growth has its limits. And let me, let me um, show you with this graph, maybe I can, oh no, I can't. Uh, with, with this graph here, uh, it's, it's not from the book, but it's from a, an economist I really uh, appreciate a lot, it's Herman Daly. And there you have a graph on the top, and that's the empty world, and you have a graph in the bottom, and that's the full world. And then you can see that at the top you have the planet, it's in green, it's the biosphere. And the economy, which is a subsystem of the biosphere, is small. And then you have all the, ma the, the matter and energy that enters and goes out. 
and the ecosystem which has, you can see this green arrow with the ecosystem services and you have here the economy and you can see that this brown arrow with the economic services. And then you have the bottom and that's a full world. The biosphere is limited, it's finite and the economy grew and grew and grew. And that's the full world that we have now. And that is the warning that these young um, academians uh, uh, were telling in 1972, maybe it was too soon to put this kind of warning, no? And what are the drivers? Sorry, I had to put like that. What are the drivers of that transition from an empty world to a four world. The drivers are economic growth, consumption growth, growth of population. So the reason, and, and I'm sorry, in the, in the bottom graphic you can see that the, gray, the, the green arrow of service ecosystems is very, very small. It's smaller than the services of economics. So it's, it's a very graphic figure just to see how the economy grows and we're losing ecosystem services. And that is the problem that they warned in 1972. But policymakers and a lot of people that make decisions didn't understand it. Not yet. So now, this is the same Dennis Meadows in 2012 at the same institution and 40 years later. A little bit, a bit older. <laughs> as you can see, and uh, you can see this, this presentation, it's really, uh, really interesting and, uh, and um, incredibly, uh, um, incredibly, uh, with plenty of ideas, no, you, you, you really have, each time I, I, I listen it to you, uh, it, I get different ideas. So what is the, the title of that presentation? Sorry, uh, yeah. is that the perspectives on limits of growth, it's too late for sustainable development. And what Dennis Meadows says, we must think that we are not going to achieve sustainability. And we must begin to be clear that we must seek resilience. We have to move from wanting sustainable development to, de to development that allows us to survive. So, and he says, this is not a pessimistic view, but it's too late. 40 years before, it wasn't too late, but now it's too late. No, so that's, um, that's something very important to, um, to understand. No? Now this book is being read by policy makers. So to transition to resilient economies, we, we, we need to think in terms of economic growth to survive, to the ecological breakdown. That's something important. And then the consumption. In terms of consumption, we need to think of frugality. And frugality is this this example, I think it's uh, with this Swiss knife, is a very interesting. What are the functions? What are the, how to focus on core functions, unnecessary functions? Why do, we, we, why do we want to buy unnecessary functions? Reduction in cost, expensive to produce. Reduction in complexity. Do we buy because it's nice to have or need to have? So that's frugality. And um, circular economy is all about this. Resilience, frugality. No, the, uh, sorry. The, the, the circular economy is about all, all, all this. Transformation of capitalism, resilience, frugality. And the fourth concept, just transition. The, this, the, the approach of circular economy must be an approach to ensure that, that it does not per perpetuate existing inequalities of the linear economic model. So you have those, all those concepts, transformation of capitalism, resilience, 
frugality and just transition. This is the, a map of uh, the lack countries, and these are all the, all the different policies that foster um, circular economy. As you can see, every country has, uh, has a different policy to foster, uh, uh, to foster a circular economy. No? And uh, what we can see, uh, one, one conclusion that we can see there is that the areas that are priority for the circular economy in luck countries, like mining, extractive sector, waste management, recycling, and the food systems, because Latin America is a big uh, world producer of, uh, of food, no? But this is not enough, because those are policies that tackle with precise points. But what I was saying before is that we need a big transformation. And speaking about the food system, if we want, if we want that the uh, circular economy has to be an opportunity for the food system in the lag countries, the transformation has to be big. Those policy policies are not enough because they are very precise. This is a paper that, that was issued this year at World Development Review, and I think it's a very interesting paper because it's a provocative uh, title, Why the Great Food Transformation May Not Happen. No, and four major forces are responsible for locking the food system in its current unsustainable tra trajectory. And what Benjamin Bena says, he's from Colombia, uh, um, what he says in this paper is that all these four points ha have to be tackled in a systemic way, meaning the first one, the resistance to change raised by transnational corporations. Two, government and consumers, divergent uh, rationalities. Three, technological in innovation is only driven by profit and not by sustainability. That is very important. And four, the failure of science. The failure of science to communicate and what he calls the politics of evidence. The academia has to, has to intervene more in the politics to convince to show the evidence. So the, th the, the, the thing that happened the, 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 with the limits of growth, uh, limits to growth book will not happen again if you have a good communication strategy. You have to convince. So these four forces are necessary to make the great transformation. And as I said, I don't think the lack countries are going in that pathway. No, and this is my last s slide, sorry. And in my point of view, if, you, if we want to make that great transformation, we have to think like this concept of sustainable circular bioeconomy. Not just circular economy and not that precise policy measures but it has to have an holistic vision. It has to include all the sectors. And I will take just one minute to explain this, um, this slide, uh, because it's a bit, a bit complex, but it's really interesting what you can say about her. Um, as you can see, we start with our review natural uh, services uh, that have uh, by the biodiversity and uh, ecosystem functions, no? And the ecosystem services have three, three types of services. Provision services, regulating services, cultural services. Normally, in economy, we just study this, this one, the provision services of biomass, and then we study all the value chain. And we are missing those other services of the ecosystem, the regulation services and the cultural services. No. And there you have the circular here, 
and you have the management of multiple, multiple ecosystem services here. And finally, you have what we call the socio-ecological system. This, the natural resources and the three provision of ecosystem services, is done in a so society, what we call the socio-ecological system. So there, we can include economic, sustainability or environment issues, and social issues. And this holistic view can manage that great transformation of food in Latin America, in my view. But we have to adopt this holistic view. This is, an, uh, this is a transversal strategy. And with small measures, like lack countries are doing now to tackle with a circular economy, I don't think we are going to advance further than we are in this moment. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Professor Peter Luga for this very thought-provoking um, presentation. I was very impressed that you mentioned Dennis Meadows and the limits of growth. I think that is a kind of understated and somehow forgotten piece of work, so thank you for that. I also think that the, your reference to the concept of frugality is really interesting, and it should teach us a lot about the way in which we think about our lifestyle. And finally, I think the perspective of the South American uh, atmosphere and the directions and the emphasis on the food systems was very, very uh, appropriate and relevant. So thank you, Lucia. I would now like to ask uh, uh, Professor Muntasser to uh, give us his presentation on, uh, on the topic. Professor Muntasser. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Professor Morenzi, and to us, and uh, Christina, for the organization of the oh, everything. Um, and, and I come from Sudan, and uh, this, this afternoon, uh, someone was serving me coffee, asked me, where do you come from? And I said, from Sudan. I said, where is that? And uh, I, I, but, but, but Sudan, if famous for anything, is, I'm very happy to see that uh, most of the uh, attendees here of young people is that uh, the generation, they call themselves the stone-headed generation because they, uh, they managed to topple down a long dictatorship of crypto cryptocrats. And cryptocracy is the government of thieves, you know, that's people uh, ruled my country for 30 years. And those young people with great sacrifice can... Uh, and <coughs> so, um, just before I just start talking, you know, I'll just one minute about Sudan, because that's quite relevant to what uh, Professor Lucia has mentioned. If you come to Sudan, and I encourage you to do that, not in the coming months, but maybe next year, um, <laughs> you will see, if you go to the north of Sudan, near the pyramids, where you can find uh, the largest collection of pyramids ever, one of the earliest manifestations of the failure of sustained growth. Uh, that civilization in northern Sudan actually uh, was brought to an end because of massive export of iron ore and of, uh, of uh, iron uh, products. At that time, if you have a furnace, you have to cut trees. And it is an area, it's a very fragile ecological area between the savanna and the desert. So the, uh, the um, complete uh, eradication of the vegetation there actually end up in a disaster um, because of, uh, of this massive uh, export of uh, the British called British colonialists uh, call it Birmingham of Africa because even like it's quoting the uh, at that time the British government said this is 
like Birmingham, you know, in in the in, in sense. Um, so, but my presentation today is not about that. It's about uh, in a circular economy. Uh, I would like to focus on the human beings as one of the major resources of of the of the globe. And if you look at human resources, scientists are some of the most um, valued resources, if you might say, most some of the of the rare resources, because the way that our system works is we don't really if we follow the market. Uh, if you can go to the uh, sorry, uh, that the the, the uh, the ways that things work is we are following the, the market um, uh, priorities in in uh, in uh, uh, in preparing, you know, our uh, uh, our educated, you know, in education. So, for example, in in, in Sudan, we have 35 medical schools because this is a very hot. Uh, um, you know, in the market, you know, you go to the Gulf, you work, you end up in the island. But how many marine biologists we have? Very few. Despite having one of the longest shores in the Red Sea with massive uh, diversity and uh, uh, endless opportunities for the economy. But people that, that don't see that. So, in <coughs> Uh, scientists, you can regard them as a commodity if you would like. Okay, so uh, in in, uh, in 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 our country, this rare commodity is also subject to extensive. Uh, it's not replenishable. You know, people are migrating in mass to richest country around us. Uh, and so whatever we prepare for uh, our country is migrate, you know, brain drain, as you know. Yeah. This is not as if we thought about in the past. In the past, we were nationalist, our generation. Your generation, most of you here, is more globalized, so they don't think of countries as we think of. However, the the reality is we are still living countries. So there, there is an economy that is Sudanese economy, and it has to stand its own. I mean, King Abdullah will not come and, and do our budget with us. We have to do our own budget and, uh, and care for uh, the deficiencies of this budget. So still nation state exists. So the core concept here is to recognize and fulfill the concept of uh, circular, and it's also cyclical, within a paradigm of common regional science space uh, that betters the usability and extend the academic life span of a scientist and academician. I have one question, one example in my mind. We have a very bright theoretical physicist, just like a professor here, is on Arbab. Arbab has been staying in Sudan for the past 20 years, earning like uh, $200 a month. Now it's improved a bit. But he has some children. He wants to uh, care for them. So he ended up uh, migrating to work in a University of Qasim in Saudi Arabia. Until recently, Qasim was a stronghold of the Wahhabis. And you can hardly find an attentive audience on theoretical physics in Al Qasim. But he and his ten thousand uh, dollars, and I mean it, it's ten thousand dollars a month, and that's it. You know, uh, the rest of his time is, uh, um, you know, uh, we can do recreational activities, anything. But he doesn't really involve get involved in research as he used to do in back there when he was in Sudan. He, he's just a major loss to the University of Khartoum, you know. Uh, he is an editor of the International Journal of Theoretical Physics. You know, I just, I, 
before I knew him, I wouldn't believe that in the University of Khartoum will have such a, a resource and talent. So I would, would like to think differently. Let us for a moment ignore the existence of political borders and nation states. There are many, many uh, reasons why we should do that. First, the challenges that we endure are not recognizable by nation states and by borders. For example, the COVID-19. So, uh, uh, in, in our region, uh, we have we've done very little coordination between underdeveloped countries and rich countries, like uh, countries like in the Gulf. Um, I, Egypt itself is, uh, you know, there's massive uh, uh, mobility towards the Gulf from Egyptian scientists. Uh, this is due also to population reasons, you know, Egypt is a, is a fairly developed compared to Sudan. Um, this is number one. Number two, these countries that, um, and the, my, my title of my presentation is establishing a common economic, uh, a common uh, a scientific um, uh, space across socio-economic divide, but indeed across also um, political divides, which is a nation state. And the nation state is a very, as you all know in history, it's a very recent invention. It wasn't been there for, you know, all the time. People were more likely to, uh, to eat, move easily. So uh, even across this socio-economic divide and political divide, there is a lot of interest, but it is not guided by science. For example, Saudi Arabia uh, and uh, Emirates, those are two rich countries. They have a lot of investment in agriculture and mining in Sudan. But these investments are very short term. You know, they are not really sustainable in the sense that, uh, in the economic sense. And, and, and they definitely lack any R&D. Uh, chapter. For example, what do you want to, to plant in Sudan? Is the soil reasonable? What, how would you turn these uh, uh, crops into, um, uh, you know, um, what you call the added value? You can turn them into a product that is, um, you can export or whatever. That doesn't exist. Um, so the proposal here is that we should not really, as scientists, are very rare commodities. I gave an example of Professor Arbab, and I, give, I can give a dozen of other examples, are uh, quite a rare commodity. Some of them actually uh, migrate to the Gulf, stay there, earn their salaries, and go retire. Uh, unnoticed, you know, without doing a di making any difference, neither in the Sudanese economy nor in the Gulf economy. Uh, because the, the, uh, the, the, uh, this commodity is not utilized optimally. You know, it is not utilized optimally. They just regard it as, they uh, come and give his lectures and, and that's it. So, if we're really keen on these resources, we should map them. For example, we should know how many marine biologists we have, what are the uh, narrow specialization that they have, can they have teams across the borders. I have dozens of examples in Port Sudan, which is opposite to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. There is a very rare species of turtles, very, very rare species of turtles. And in, across there, there's King Abdullah's university. Is huge funds and there is a small marine biology station here that is supposed to care for these 
uh, state is they don't have the money to do any genetic analysis whatever you know and this is actually absurd you know because uh, uh, you know uh, the, these turtles does not belong to Sudan uh, the Sudan it belongs to the human uh, uh, beings you know as, as a biological heritage you know um, so the idea here when I when, when we look at this concept of uh, circular economy is people focus on the diaspora and by the diaspora they mean people like few people who are from Sudan or from Egypt are, are uh, uh, resident in the United States they have tenure position there they can come and teach indeed there are very good examples but what about the hundreds of thousands and the tens of thousands that work in the petrodollar uh, economy. Those are the ones that we really have to focus on and have to utilize their force uh, fully. So uh, the idea here is, uh, my proposal is to extend the, uh, the definition of the diaspora to include migrants in within the vicinity, within the regional economies because you know uh, mig migration does not happen easily to the United States and even to Europe you, you know that uh, but it can happen uh, it can take place to uh, uh, countries around you know and migration is just follows it goes from the uh, lower income to the high income and uh, so we'd like to include those uh, uh, scientists in our definition and in the mapping so we can utilize their force. Uh, I have one example that I want to finish. Uh, this is the uh, uh, slide before the last one. Uh, a professor from Texas, a Sudanese, who came and had an attachment to one of the universities in uh, in the White Nile province and in this university there were two sugar factories major sugar factories that export ethanol and they're um, doing well and there is a university there and there was like 20 miles but no one in the university thought of taking those students to train there you know, it's just a matter of initiative. But he, you know, being uh, trained in the United States, he's a more uh, business-like mind. He actually made a feat, you know. Now uh, these factories are helping uh, establish an institute of sugar research in, in, uh, in the, one of the United universities. Uh, and I would like to share this uh, example with, uh, to us, you know, of, uh, some successful means and my, this is my last slide you know I was just talking about a guy in the United States so if you look at the central uh, circle this is the where the people in the international universities uh, which are was very few you know like I can count hundred Sudanese professor in the United States not more than that then you have regional uh, universities where you have thousands and then you have the national universities, of course these are many. And then you have also in the national universities you have the district universities, like in Sudan I said 35 medical schools. Uh, each state have one or two medical schools. But those are really are not up to the standard of being a real medical school. So in, in terms of uh, the mobility, you know, people actually go from the district to the national to the international. This is where people are, want to better themselves uh, up to the international. You know. But sometimes this arrow is reversed because some of the greatest minds exist in the periphery. You know, innovation in this day and age where you have the internet does not require that you have a good university to train. You can have the most brilliant ideas and you can do a lot by being in uh, by by just being yourself by being innovative and intelligent 
So we, I end up by, by saying that in doing mapping, we should look at these tiers, these different tiers, and see what, how we can utilize the human resources uh, uh, better if you want to have a good circular economy. Thank you very much. Professor Montasse, thank you very much for your presentation. Actually, I think that your first example, pre-presentation pre of the failure of sustained growth based because of the over-exploitation was very interesting. If it really fits with the um, um, theme of today and also following on from Professor Peter Luga. The point you made about the human resources of scientists is very strong, and I think it's uh, valid internationally and globally. And finally, the point also you made of common economic uh, challenges, common challenges, uh, whether they're environmental or health, you, you said COVID, okay, we've seen it throughout, uh, but challenges that are common across the economic divide, I think that is also uh, a logical uh, setting for the work that we need to do. I will pass the word now to uh, our last but not least speaker for today's is Professor Colurcio. Maria, okay. please Thank go you, ahead. Max. Good afternoon. Thank you to, to us for inviting me. Thank you, Christina, for the good organization. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, to this session. It's, it gives me a great pleasure and honor to, to be here today to reflect, to think um, all together about the future. So, about, uh, about circular economy, what can we can do? That the world's population is growing and with it also the demand for raw material. And uh, the supply of, cru uh, of uh, crucial raw materials is limited, as we know. And uh, some European countries, as you can see on the slide, are dependent on, uh, other, uh, on other countries for their raw material. And uh, in this time, as you know, this, this issue is more thorny than ever. So uh, you know that uh, the price of a number of raw material is rising. And uh, for some of them, there are difficulties and delays in supplies. These result in uh, serious obstacles to our life and, to, and for the activities of firms, of companies. For sure, problems come from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, from the Ukraini Ukrainian crisis are an important cause, uh, cause an important reason uh, of such situation, so not the only one. So, um, however, these are signal of a structure of a structural underlying trend that should that should not be overlooked in the context of uh, a global and globalized development. In addiction, we know that uh, extracting. Uh, uh, and using uh, raw materials uh, has a major impact on the environment uh, and also increases um, energy um, consumption and CO2 uh, emissions. So uh, you know that uh, my research field is management, uh, so my talk will focus on uh, firms behavior. Okay, and firms are important actors in the transition process toward a circular economy, toward a low impact economy and low impact business model. The success of circular economy depends on the ability of firms and on their commitment to design and to adopt business models that innovate and uh, minimize the use of resources and uh, business model that are sustainable both on the environmental point of view and on the social point on the social point of view so but what is circular economy 
just uh, a few viewers a few words circular economy is a model of production and consumption which involves sharing leasing reusing refurbishing uh, recycling sorry for the editing of the slide and uh, circular economy focus on the extension of the life of product as soon um, as as long as possible so it implies uh, the extension um, of um, life of product on one side and on the other side the reduction of waste to minimum uh, at, um, it means that um, at the end of the la of their life product uh, um, the parts of product and materials are kept are kept again in the supply uh, chain in the economy and then again and again according to a circular and iterative and endless uh, logic so this is a clear departure from uh, the traditional linear model which is based on take make consume throw away okay so this model the circular model relies on large quantities of cheap easily accessible materials and energy well so a glance to the global trend about circular uh, economy oh, uh, so in um, between 2018 and 2020 the, circular, the global circular rate uh, decreased uh, as you can see in the, in the slide and uh, this is due both to the increase of consumption as in last five years consumption increased um, more or less uh, by uh, by eight uh, percent while reuse uh, while reuse consumption increased just by three uh, percent and uh, on the other hand, the, the, the decrease of circularity rate depends also on the, on the um, use of raw materials. Sorry for the Spanish materias primas in the, in the slide. <laughs> but the, uh, as you can see, more than 100 billion, 100 billion of tons uh, of raw material were employed in one year to produce good and service and over half of this enormous quantity of material was employed to produce good with a short uh, lifespan so uh, yes this is awful but these uh, these are european yes these are european stats so um, however uh, something changed when we go to italy it's uh, maybe it's uh, new for you and also for me since two years ago but italy is the is the first european country for circularity we are also be, uh, we are also uh, before france uh, uh, france and germany okay and so you can see that our rate of ci about circular economy are better than the average uh, uh, then the European rage, both in terms of uh, use of um, uh, the use of um, uh, reused material, and also in terms of contribution to the gross uh, to the gross um, domestic product uh, in terms of euro. So um, specifically, I have to add that we are so good in use, reuse, in, uh, in using, in employing uh, reused raw material, but we have to improve something in terms of sharing uh, uh, economy pattern. So uh, this is our situation, but uh, um, this Italian performance in terms of circularity depends on, depends on uh, Firm behavior on firm's behavior depends on a combination of creativity, uh, attitude to innovation, competen competencies, technology, and so uh, a, a good mix. Let's go. Let's move to some example. And 
let's uh, let's go to um, let's go to see how we can improve how we can activate uh, virtuous circle virtuous model for uh, circular economy how first of all we should learn to think out of the box as creativity is one of the first resource for the for the circular uh, uh, economy so what do you see here? bread a piece of bread i can suggest a piece and of old bre uh, bread from the perspective of the um, of the is is, a, is a, an unsold bread and uh, you know that uh, <laughs> you uh, maybe you don't know but food is the greatest amount of waste for italian and bread together with vegetables is uh, the greatest okay so uh, furthermore, we have to say that uh, for, the, for the, the waste of bread, in Italy we have a sort of feeling of guilt, okay? Because it is a product that has not an high value or price, but is very important in our tradition and uh, in, our, so in our culture. So, uh, what you can do? What we can do with the piece of old or unsold bread, a um, we, can, uh, we can try to eat it when we are at home, we can try to eat it with water and uh, tomato or with a soup. Okay? But, but if it is unsold, what can I do? Okay? And uh, biova. Bio what is biova? Biova, yes, think out of the box. Um, two young entrepreneurs, two young Italian entrepreneurs, um, transformed this waste, unsold bread, in a beer. Okay? The business idea is called Biova, yes, and the name came from a typical uh, bread, a typical Italian bread uh, from the Piemonte region, Okay, and so these two young entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs set up a, um, a system through which they collect the unsold, uh, the unsold wood-fired uh, um, bread from Owens and uh, they, um, they, through a, a typical production process, they make uh, the bread, uh, the old bread, to ferment and then they have an ale beer okay now what we have today uh, i have to i i invite you to to google uh, by, uh, biova and to say that uh, it it is a, a good startup with uh, good performance and uh, i have to say that through this process and through this business idea, they, re they save, they reduced the, the use of raw material by up to 30% as the bread include, the bread includes both sugar and yeast that helps the beer to ferment. So this is a, an example of a circular economy. But for example, what do you see here? Again, waste from food on the, on the left, orange, uh, just orange, but uh, the business idea, orange fiber, comes from, uh, not only from orange, but also from uh, lemons, uh, citrus, uh, uh, lemons, citrus, and, uh, and uh, other fruit. And uh, two young girls, two Italian young girls with competencies uh, both in marketing field and uh, in um, fashion still, uh, fashion, um, fashion field, um, generated, uh, created a new, uh, a new company, a new firm, a startup uh, that uses the waste of orange to, to produce a fabric. 100% biodegradable, that is like a silk. And the real novelty is that 
a lot of famous Italian brands like Ferragamo, Marinella used this fabric. P for example, Ferragamo launched a special collection with the um, orange fiber fabric. And also the, the Swedish brand H&M uh, used this, uh, this fabric. Just to one more uh, example, yes, this is a, a sort of a used coffee. Again, two young, uh, two young entrepreneurs had the idea to use this waste as a resource. And in this time, it's really, uh, it's really interesting their idea, their idea because they transform this waste in a coffee pellet. Do you know pellet? It's, uh, yes, it's, um, it's for a stove. And um, it is a yeah, um, and um, it is a completely natural and uh, reduce the raw material and produce a sort of pellet you see you see in the in the slide, flowered to the coffee that um, is uh, that uh, and as the rate of humidity more um, very uh, very low and. Of course, is a, 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 is a, a low impact on the environment. So these are just three examples, but we have a lot of examples. But what we, but what do we need to act, uh, to um, trigger circular economy process? What are the main resources we need? So I, uh, I said creativity, and of course. Creativity, la, uh, in sense of think out of the box. Then uh, competencies, technical competencies. Now, in the example, I, I didn't underline the the, the, t the, um, the technical competencies needed for the fermentation process or for the fabric and also for the pellet. Okay, but of course we need competencies. Technology, okay, the role of technology to trigger, to foster uh, circular economy is really important. But we need also something, uh, something more, okay, uh, to be more circular, okay. I go to conclude because someone give me uh, uh, a warning, okay. So um, we have to think that uh, um, moving toward toward the uh, circular economy requires a cultural approach, okay? And the cultural approach is needed both on the production and on the consumption side. On the production side, we, we need to, to reflect about the opportunity and possibility to broaden the guideline for the design, to expand for the industrial design, for example, to expanding the criteria focusing on uh, durability, on reuse, uh, on the employment, on the employment of reused raw material, and uh, about the circularity of production processes is uh, really important to, to promote a culture for the um, industrial symbiosis, uh, symbiosis. I mean, it's very important the connection uh, along all the supply chain. So symbiosis, uh, industrial symbiosis mean, means that a waste for a, for a firm becomes a resource for another firm as the circular economy is a never-ending circle, endless circle. So, and uh, about the circularity of production process, another, another issue is about the, the planned obsolescence, for example. That is a pattern that, uh, that invites uh, uh, people and consumer to consume and consume and consume. And not uh, re and non and and not uh, rehab. So on the um, on side of consumption and uh, I close. We need more reliable information. Uh, consumer need to be informed in a reliable uh, uh, manner, and uh, 
uh, we need a more training and education about a circular culture, a circular consumer culture for all. So, thank you very much for your attention. I like this. Thank you. Uh, Professor Colurcio, I thank you for um, a very energetic delivery of presentation and in particular about the positivity of the messages. I think that many people need some inspiring examples to believe that this can be a reality. I think that some of the points you made were exceptional. Uh, personally, I'm still uh, kind of shocked and pleased uh, to hear that Italy is doing okay from a circular point of view, better than France and Germany. I, I, I'll take your word for that. Um, I, I'm also... European Commission <laughs> I was also extremely impressed that you um, uh, very strongly put across the concept of uh, food waste and, and possible food resource. And finally, but not, not not in the least, you put emphasis on education for a culture. And I think that is an amazing concept. So I would like to thank all three um, speakers. And we do have time for questions. I have lots of questions. But I will give priorities to uh, the, uh, the audience. Yes, we have one question immediately there. Hello, uh, thank you for the lovely presentation. My question is to Miss, uh, sorry, Professor Maria. Um, um, I would like to join to the scientific research. Uh, in the developed countries, we are in a long run of publishing and discovering something new. And we use a lot of preclinical models, such as mice and, um, and rodents or monkeys, let's say. So what's your comment in the circular economy or SDG goal in using a lot of this model uh, for the scientific research? Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting point. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we could have um, a long time to discuss about the point, you know in the sense that to advance science, uh, we need to use resources. But I think that uh, the frugal uh, view that uh, Lucia Pitaluga proposed uh, is the right way to approach the use of model also in uh, science. I hope, uh, I, hope, I, I hope I answer your... Um, okay. Are there any comments uh, from the other speakers from, on that particular question? No, okay. Hi, uh, good afternoon. First, I wanted to thank for the very interesting uh, lecture. And well, it's very good to, like you have mentioned many times about uh, creativity, kind of like disbelief in development among the young. And I think that's really, really great. And I actually wanted to know whether like actually governments or institutions are taking some sort of action in order to boost that creativity sort of like uh, thinking into young people if they are making them aware of like which steps to take because as you mentioned like internet is a wonderful tool but it's really good if I don't know if you are as well like guided in a more professional way so yeah okay thank you for the thank your you. question okay um, you know in Italy Okay. In Italy, the last uh, PNRR plan from the government is a uh, aim to such kind of education. Specifically, uh, specific a part of the plan is dedicated to creativity and is um, one of the, tra of the um, transversal action of the plan is uh, the generational gap. Is, uh, so the plan aim to improve skills and uh, competencies of young to boost uh, a circular and sustainable entrepreneurship. So please uh, check on, go, uh, on the 
gov uh, government uh, website and you can find some call very interesting for young people. And perhaps, given that this is a very interesting question, we could also hear the perspective from different cultures and countries, from Professor Muntaser and Professor Pitaluga, on, on that question of how to boost creativity in education and so on. I think uh, creativity is boosted by a collective uh, um, open-minded open and open innovation network. So I think the, the I mean, in my, in my view, the, the, the better tools, uh, the better policy tools that I have seen in, in my country, Uruguay, is uh, when the, uh, you have the, the possibility to gather people, to gather young people, and to interact. I, I, I don't think creativity is an individual action. I think it's a collective, and I think it's better. I mean, it, it's, there's more creativity if you have that, that collective and network, um, uh, um, uh, how do you say, um, uh, modes of, of, of doing things. Uh, interestingly, I have been through uh, publication that uh, education is the most critical aspect of uh, development now or uh, performance for countries and this is uh, inversely proportional to the um, uh, availability of resources you know the more you are resourced the less the education system is. I don't know how, how <laughs> um, uh, it makes you wonder, you know, because <clears throat> UK and Japan are uh, some of the most, and Taiwan and Singapore are the most, most under-resourced. You know, it just what someone wonders, you know, the queen, uh, you know, reigning over uh, those hundreds of millions from this small island. This has something to do with education because I think the Scottish uh, system of education was one of the best. But uh, for us, I think after 30 years of ideological uh, development, uh, educational system, we have to stay away from the pedagogical, you know, this, you know, that everything is known. You know, people are even questioning the school system itself now on this and they is, you know, with uh, what's known as inquiry-based science education. You have to start early at uh, preschool and encourage people to think. And, uh, but we are still uh, in the developing countries who are quite behind in this, uh, in this aspect, you know. So uh, who knows what the future holds, you know, but... Uh, well, thank you for your comments. I received uh, uh, signals that we must close this session because the time is up, which is a great shame uh, because I, I feel that we are all uh, uh, quite a bit energized or a bit inspired or a bit provoked. And I hope you will take some of this away with you and carry on your reflections. Perhaps you will start to read more about this and discuss amongst yourselves. Uh, however, uh, the speakers and myself will be out of this room, out of the building, should you want to follow us. If you have a burning question, please do so. We would like to hear more about you and feel free to send questions by email as well. Uh, I think this is such an important topic and young people need to be inspired. Thank you so much and thank you to the speakers. <laughs>